I'm going to talk in this final lecture about ethics. Now, ethics is the branch of philosophy that concerns itself with two broad kinds of questions, two families of issues. The first is about value. It's about the good life. It's about whether there are things in this world that have some kind of intrinsic value, is what philosophers often mean. And when they mean intrinsic value, what they're talking about is some kind of value that holds of the thing in and of itself, as opposed to things that are valuable merely as tools or means, or the usual word here is instruments, as instruments to other things. So, for example, I might value money very much, and money is valuable. But money isn't valuable in itself. Money is valuable in as much as it can get me something else. And there's a very old idea, going back all the way to Aristotle, which says that, well, once we make this observation that some things are valuable for other things, a is perhaps valuable for B, and perhaps B is valuable for C, well, now we're often running on a kind of regress or chain. And so a natural question to ask is, what happens at the end of the chain, or is there an end of the chain? And Aristotle's famous answer, and many philosophers have followed him in this, is that, well, there has to be an end of the chain. And the chain can only end in something that is somehow valuable in and of itself in something that carries its value in itself. Okay. And so philosophers have argued over the years, thousands of years, about what sorts of thing those things might be that are somehow valuable in themselves. Okay. Aristotle's own answer was what he, something he called eudaimonia, which is often translated as happiness, and that's a fine translation as long as it's borne in mind that what he has in mind is not some transitory feeling, but rather something more like uh, a well-lived life, a life that's full of a particularly human kind of flourishing. Flourishing is a, is a, um, a more contemporary translation of the term. Um, <clears throat> and of course there have been other thoughts about which things might have a kind of intrinsic value John Stuart Mill talked about pleasure. Um, of course, some of the ancient Greeks talked about pleasure too. Perhaps love, perhaps education, perhaps other things. And then, on the other end, there are questions about whether there might be things that have somehow a kind of intrinsic disvalue. Some things that are just bad in and of themselves. Perhaps something like pain or death. Now, of course, the claim is not that those things can't lead to good things. Pain and death, I think, I think can lead to good things. But the claim would be rather that, nevertheless, even if they have good consequences, they are somehow bad in and of themselves. Okay? And so this first group of questions that ethics concerns itself with is about uh, what states of the world or states of affairs are good states of affairs. Which ones are better than others? And what makes a good state of affairs a good state of affairs? What sorts of things have this kind of value in and of themselves? If anything. Now notice, uh, if there are such things that have a kind of value in and of themselves, well, then they would have that value quite independently of society or culture, and therefore quite independently of what people actually value. And so we could have the, the very real possibility that people value things that aren't actually valuable, or that they don't value things that are actually valuable. Okay? And so we get this kind of idea that maybe there's um, some kind of objectivity in ethics, that some things just are valuable, whether or not anybody recognizes them or any society or culture recognizes them. Okay, so that's one broad family of issues. Which, what sorts of things are good and what sorts of things are bad? And the second broad uh, family of issues that ethics deals with is a set of issues that pertain to 
action. How ought I to behave? What kind of life shall I lead? Uh, are there certain kinds of actions that I have somehow an obligation to perform? Or perhaps on the other end, an obligation to avoid doing actions that are somehow forbidden to me. Questions about rights, questions about duties, about obligations. Uh, and we can throw in questions of justice in this, in this area too. Okay. So on the one hand, questions about value, about the good. And on the other hand, questions about the right, questions about action. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> and of course, the second class of actions, if not the first, the second, sorry, class of issues, if not the first, is what makes ethics such a very practical part of philosophy, because it's concerned with what I ought to do with my life. Okay. Now, why in the world do we talk about ethics in a critical reasoning class? Well, it's important for us for two reasons. First, uh, ethical reasoning is something we do every day. It's very familiar. We all make moral judgments. And so it's a very natural application of some of the tools we've already learned in this class. So that'll be our first sort of broad focus for today. And the second reason is that because ethics is so immediate and so familiar, if we look at how moral reasoning often uh, shapes up, I think we can learn actually quite a great deal about the nature of philosophy quite generally and how its method is, how it tends to proceed. Okay, and so that'll be our second main topic for the day. Okay, so first, uh, moral reasoning is a kind of paradigmatic use of, of critical reasoning. Well, I think it should be very familiar to you that we all make moral judgments every day. Uh, we might have strong feelings about someone else's actions or perhaps our own actions. We might have certain moral intuitions about the status of certain kinds of actions like, say, abortion or the death penalty or prostitution or a government taxing us or whatever, on and on and on. Okay. <clears throat> And the point for our purposes now, in a critical reasoning class, is that very often behind these judgments that we make, there is, in fact, some kind of reasoning, some kind of argumentation going on. But as usual, very often premises may be suppressed, uh, the form of the argument may be unclear in ordinary conversation, but if you do a little digging, very often you can you can construct some kind of reconstruct a kind of argument that explains where someone is coming from. Okay. So, for example, <clears throat> uh, if we take someone who's against capital punishment, someone who's got a strong view that there's somehow something immoral about, about punishing people capitally, that is, with, with death, Well, probably there's some kind of general moral principle that's lying behind that judgment. Probably something to the effect um, of the wrongness of taking life quite generally. If killing is wrong, quite generally, well then of course capital punishment is wrong too, in as much as it's a form of killing. Okay, And so it's not hard to find and construct a valid argument for with with a, a as conclusion the claim that capital punishment is wrong. Okay, all you really need is two premises: killing is wrong, capital punishment is a kind of killing, therefore capital punishment is wrong. Okay, and that's a good valid argument. Of course, whether or not it's sound is another matter. Um, probably it's unquestionable that capital punishment involves killing, but of course the other premise, this kind of general moral principle that we've enunciated, namely that killing is wrong, or all killing is wrong, or killing is always wrong, well, of course, that's a good deal more controversial, and it would need some, some justification, uh, <clears throat> especially in light of the fact that there seem to be a great many cases of killing that don't seem wrong. Okay, uh, Capital punishment is, is of course, the, the controversial case at hand, but there are other sorts of cases that don't seem to be uh, 